Okay, so today we're going to give you a introduction to thermodynamics. This is ninth grade biology, and I'm going to be absent, so I'm going to do an intro lecture online for my students to watch while I'm gone. Um, so there's lots of details, and this could be much more complicated than I'm going to make it. It's pretty simple. Um, and normally this is an interactive lecture, so there's lots of opportunity for the kids to participate, and we're going to kind of skip over that for the sake of the video. So this chapter has both photosynthesis and cellular respiration in it, which are two of the more difficult components of the biology year. So today I'm just trying to introduce some intro level vocabulary so that when we start talking about the conversions that take place during photosynthesis and cellular respiration, things are a little bit easier than they could be. So how many types of energies can you think of? So thermodynamics is the study of energy or energy changes within an environment. So, so we're thinking of biology and how many types of energies can you think of? So we should immediately be able to think of the sun giving energy to plants and plants giving energy to animals. Um, you might think a little bit outside of the biology world and you might think of geoenergy, geothermal energy like the geysers. You might think of electric energy, kinetic energy. I'm usually given potential and kinetic as answers. Wind energy, solar energy. There's all kinds of energy available. So we're going to talk about a couple rules that govern the transformation of one ener energy into another. So first, what is energy? It's the ability to do work, period. So potential energy, you have stored energy, so it has the potential to do work. And then kinetic energy, you have the actual energy of work. In chemistry, we learned that energy is stored in bonds and released when bonds are broken. So that's kind of an important concept for us to remember. As we go into photosynthesis, we're going to be making bonds. And as we go into cellular respiration, we're going to be breaking bonds. So we're going to be able to relate those two, whether energy is being stored or whether energy is being released. So what are some examples of energy conversions you can think of? So we, we might think about converting the energy of food that we eat into energy of motion because it gives us energy to do things like play sports. Um, you might think of the solar energy that you use to maybe light the house that you live in. Um, we harvest or harness um, hydroelectric energy, hydro water um, through the dams that give us energy to light our lights as well. Um, but why is it important to us for life? And this is where I usually get pretty generic answers from students. We need it to live. But that doesn't tell me what I'm using my energy for. So you got to think a little bit more deeply and what is your body actually using energy for? And then students most likely begin with, I need it to run, I need it to play. Um, so let's get inside of our bodies. What is our body using it for? We need energy to pump our blood. Our heart requires energy. Any of our muscles require energy. Um, we need it to digest our food. Pretty much you could come up with all of your body systems and whatever they do, they need energy. So you can be a little bit more specific in your claim, we need energy to live. You can give more specific reasonings for that need. How do we obtain energy? Can we just create energy from standing in the sunlight? No, we get energy from the food we eat. Um, and then what's the ultimate source of energy? The GY bet is disappearing there. Um, the ultimate source of energy is the sun. I believe that is a test question and a final exam question. So memorize that one. Um, so how do your cells need energy? What do your cells need energy for? Um, so we already said the things our whole body needs energy for, but what about your cells? What do our cells use energy for? In the last chapter, we talked about membrane transport. Any energy needed there? If we use active transport, we need energy to pump energy or molecules against their gradient. Um, in 
the chemistry chapter, we talked about biosynthesis, making macromolecules. That's going to require energy. We talked about chemical reactions that were endothermic. They took in energy and exothermic that gave off energy. So any of those endothermic reactions, which were usually building forms, um, those chemical reactions all require energy. Breaking down molecules, we said that enzymes lower the activation energy needed for a reaction to occur which means that reaction required energy in the first place and still requires energy, it just requires less. So we're going to need um, energy to build things, to break things, for active transport to move it across a membrane, um, transmitting genetic instruction, so going from DNA to RNA and RNA to proteins. That's going to require energy. So your cells are going to need energy in order to replicate, make more cells. Um, and, and that's just naming a handful of things right there. So now you have reasonings for your claims, right? We want to justify the claims we make. Cells need energy to live. What do they need them specifically for in order for life to occur? Okay, so thermodynamics. We're studying the transformation of energy in the universe. Now, we're not going to really study the entire universe. We're just studying our little ecological space. So for the most part, we're talking about food webs and food chains. So there's two laws we need to know. First law of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy. What does conservation mean? To conserve, right? So that's using a word in its own definition. That's not very good. Um, so conservation of energy is not losing energy. Okay, so we're going to talk more about that in a minute. And again, this disappeared behind my head. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy. What is entropy? Entropy is a measure of disorder in the universe. The universe loves disorder. So things that increase disorder happen more easily. So here's our laws. The law of conservation of energy states, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only changed in form. So that sun's energy can be changed into chemical energy. That water's energy can be changed into electric energy. I can't create energy out of nothing. I can't um, destroy energy. It is always there. We just have to account for all of the components of the energy. So here we have changing mechanical energy into a f energy of friction. And still, we didn't create this. We just transformed it from one to another. So you want to know that law. In this food web, we know that we change energy, we transform energy from the sun to the plants, the plants to the animals, and animals to all these other plants. Okay, so we're just transforming the energy from one form to another. That's the first law. The second law is the law of entropy, which states energy cannot be converted without the loss of usable energy. So I said the universe likes disorder. If the energy were going to be completely 100% transformed with no loss, that would be very tidy, right? That would be very neat and orderly. But the universe likes disorder. So we're going to lose some of that energy to space. The majority of lost energy goes in the form of heat. So like, you know, you're producing heat, it keeps us warm, and it's getting off of us and surrounding us. So we are personally losing that component of the energy, but the universe hasn't lost it. It's still there. It's just been lost in another form, and that form is heat. So we can talk about food webs, food chains. At each level, only about 10% of energy is passed on. That's a 10% rule you want to know. So we can see that these are decreasing in the amount of energy that's available. The same thing here. You can see these animals are losing energy to the universe. Now they're going to use some of the energy for themselves. This plant is going to reproduce its cells. It's going to go through cellular respiration. It's going to use photosynthesis. All these reactions are going to require energy as well. So in the end, it uses some and it loses some to the, to the environment. And then it passes on only about 10%. And on this test, you should be able to calculate how much energy was passed from one level to the next. So you want to only give 10% of what that plant or animal got to the next level.
Get it? Okay, so the missing energy I already talked about, it's lost as thermal energy. So usually it's converted into heat. And you can see here, lots of the sun's energy coming to the plants, and the plants are losing quite a bit of it in the form of heat. Or it, even the sun's energy, not all of it is even going to the plant. Many rays of it um, are being reflected off of the plants themselves. So if you think about um, the fact that the plants are green, white light is made up of every color in the spectrum. So we know colors are produced by reflecting wavelengths of light. So this shows you the fact that you see green, you know those wavelengths aren't being absorbed and they're just being reflected back. So that is entropy. You're losing that self-contained piece of energy. So what's a heterotroph? Hopefully you jumped right at that and you said it's something that can't make its own food. So other heterotroph feeder. It eats other things. An autotroph? So an autotroph would be a self-feeder, so it makes its own food. What kind of things are heterotrophs? Plants, not usually. Animals, uh, fungi, those are saprophytes, actually. They're going to digest things. Um, some bacteria are heterotrophs, some bacteria are autotrophs. Photoautotrophs are those autotrophs that make their food using the sun's energy. So that would be your plants. Chemoautotrophs, these are your bacteria. Some bacteria can take chemicals and then convert them into organic molecules. Uh, metabolism we talked about in chemistry. So hopefully you jumped at that one and said it's the sum total of all chemical reactions that occur in a cell or a body. So that would be the things that are building up and the breaking down. And in this chapter, the building up and the breaking down, breaking down that we're concerned with has to do with photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So photosynthesis is the way that plants use the sun's energy to make, ener to make food. And then cellular respiration is the process where we take that food that was made and we convert it into chemical energy that we can use. So we talked about metabolism in the chemistry chapter. Now a little bit more, we're going to talk about pathways. So a pathway is when one chemical reaction feeds another chemical reaction. So you can have a number of chemical reactions all attached. We're just going to connect photosynthesis to cellular respiration. So um, the product of one is the reactant for the next. So photosynthesis makes glucose here, and then glucose is the reactant for the next reaction. So that's cellular respiration right there. So you have catabolic reactions, which um, break things down, catabolism, I think of a catastrophe, it destroyed things. So that releases energy when you break bonds. An anabolic, think anabolic steroids makes people big. Um, so anabolic is building. So we are going to store energy in the form of bonds because we're making larger and larger molecules. So you might think photosynthesis, cellular respiration, which is which? Which one is catabolic? Which one is anabolic? Photosynthesis builds glucose. So that makes it anabolic. So it takes the sun's energy, it converts it into chemical A. We're going to call it glucose for this. And then cellular respiration is going to take chemical A and break it down into chemical B, which is ATP. So cellular respiration is a catabolic reaction. So ATP is what our body uses as its energy source. So inside of us, all of our cells are doing things with the help of ATP. So ATP, we talked about again in the chemistry chapter, it's called adenosine triphosphate. You need to know that for the exam. It has an adenine nucleotide here, nitrogen base, with a ribose sugar and a phosphate. So all nucleotides have these three components, though this is a variable. Um, adenine can change to thiamine, cytosine, guanine, uracil, Okay, this one has three phosphates. That makes it different than the nucleotides that we use to make uh, DNA. So, so these three phosphates are all negatively charged. And, and we're trying to get that idea that things that are of the same charge will repel each other, right? They're not attracted. So these two are trying to get away and these bonds are holding them together. So when they break, 
they release a lot of energy. So, so that's how ATP is useful to us, is that we break the bond between the second and third energy, and then that bond, or second and third phosphate group here, and then that energy is available for cells to do work. Active transport, reproduction, whatever they need it for. Chemical reactions of building other molecules. So energy is stored when bonds are formed. Energy is released when bonds are broken. So when we break that bond between the second and third phosphate, we release a whole lot of energy. We talked about sodium potassium pump. That was an example of when um, we would use that ATP energy, that phosphate. It's broken and it's transferred to this sodium potassium pump. A lot of times when you transfer a phosphate, that phosphate activates whatever it is that it's attaching to. So in this case, it's attaching to the sodium potassium pump. It moves three sodium molecules out, and out here it's going to grab hold of two potassiums, place them right there, and it's going to pull two potassiums in. So that's one example of how our cells would use the energy that it got from ATP, that it got from cellular respiration, that came from photosynthesis, that came from the sun. And that's a story of thermodynamics. So let's be anabolic and build off of this.